Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? <laughs> in today's episode, we are going to talk about women's health. Nice. And specifically, we're going to talk about a woman named Mary Baker Eddy. Oh, all right. Let's do this. All right. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 38, Whoa. What's Her Name? And Health, Religion, and Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy. Woohoo! This is, I've said many times on the podcast that... Women's history is religious history, mm -hmm. and women's history is medical history. Let it be known. You have said these things. I have said it many times, and I've Mary Baker Eddy, <laughs> I've been present. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Baker Eddy is the combination of those two things. Oh. And so it would be, we would be remiss not to do an episode on her, but before... Uh, we get into that. I imagine this is a name that you're not super familiar with. I am only familiar with it because I'm your friend. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I did not learn about MBE in my rhyme raising. Okay. So one of the problems with teaching women's history is that for some reason, women's names don't make it into the canon of names that last, even when those women are household names in their time. Interesting. So they were celebrities. Celebrities, well-known, um, outspoken, famous, famous people famous during people their era. During their time, people would have known their name. And somehow just like time goes on and those names disappear. And Mary Baker Eddy is one of many examples of people like that. And I want to just give a quick shout out to another podcast. Ooh, I um, love doing this. Because it is the title of our episode today, which is oh. the What's Her Name podcast. <laughs> hey! Um, so it's two uh, women historians who pick a woman every, I think it's weekly or, or frequently, and they, they do a very well-researched episode nice. on that person. And I think it is helpful in getting those names yeah. better known and better, you know, some deep, rich history there. Yeah. Um, because... There are women whose names and stories should like should be really staples mm -hmm. and should be better known, but it's it's just lost. And I don't I don't it, it, to me it's sort of like why did this name get lost? It doesn't actually yeah. make any sense. And um, Mary Baker Eddy really epitomizes the it not making sense. Okay. And I just want to give you a couple really simple examples. Yeah. Um, because right. she's so something. fascinating. So okay. first of all, I think that Mary, so we are trying to take a women's history and get it into schools. Mm -hmm. And not every person that ever lived belongs in a history class. But there are people whose history and stories are influential, are powerful, or are simply just meaningful for yeah. for what they are. And Mary Baker Eddy should be taught in schools because she is the first woman in world history to found a sustaining religion. I'm sorry. Say that louder for the people in the back. <laughs> the first woman, you can Google it. Who was the first woman to found a religion? Mary Baker Eddy. M-B-E was the first. Boom. Okay. Okay. We're so, in. So that's, I think, the most important thing. And then for, you know, we are based here in New Hampshire. And so for New Hampshire people, I, I am, I'm like dumbfounded how few New Hampshire people know this name. When Mary Baker Eddy was born in Bow in 1821, born in Bow, New Hampshire, which is just south of the capital Concord, which if you don't know where that is, it's in the middle of the state. <laughs> And it's not like the North Carolina Concord. No, it's, it's Concord. 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 Just like a northerner would say it. Yeah. I, and, made, I made that mistake not being from the state. Yeah. Sorry. And you learned. Yeah, you pronounce things wrong, but we'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So she is born here in Bow. But more importantly, uh, those of you familiar with the Concord skyline probably have seen it from 90, Route 93, which is the yes, you see super the, highway. The gold top of the Capitol building. Yes. You and see the- to the left of that building, mm-hmm. the tallest building in the town, the city of Concord is the Christian Science Church. That's what that is? Founded by Mary Baker Eddy. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah. I mean, when you can rival the Capitol building, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big deal in, in Concord. 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 Super cool. <laughs> no, but it's um, not a, I mean, for our listeners who've never been to Concord, New Hampshire, um, it's not a giant city for a capital, but no. um, actually Manchester and Nashua, two other cities in New Hampshire are larger, I would say. Yeah. But, Absolutely. Um, big buildings. Nice city. Yeah. Beautiful downtown. It's and along the Merrimack. Know, Merrimack River. Yep. And the so that's just one silly example of like literally you see New it. Hampshire Capitol building, <laughs> her church. <laughs> right. So I think that's that's really a powerful like statement about how important she was to New Hampshire history during that time. Uh-huh. Um, she, and when did she live? Sorry. So she lives in through through. She was born in 1821. Okay. She uh, is about our age during the Civil War, and founds her religion in the decades after that, and passes away in the early 1900s. Okay. Are we going to get into her history of how she came to Absolutely. America? Okay. Then I will hold my question there. Yeah. Hold <laughs> that question. So. Um, she is the first woman from New Hampshire who was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame. and Which is where? Uh, in New York, upstate New York. Okay. And if you are oh, in, a social um, media... Seneca? In Seneca Falls, yep. Yeah. And if you uh, are a social media person, you could follow Women of the Hall. And they actually just released their 2021 list of inductees. But... Mary Baker is the first one from New Hampshire to be inducted. And we don't have a ton of women whose history is really, like, powerful and profound. And in so, New Hampshire? In New Hampshire. And so, you know, that I think that's important that, like, and I don't mean powerful and profound, like, in a national sense. There are women no, who are like, important to No, but, like, what grade right now are kids getting civics? Because that's when you do your local government, right? Right, totally. And that would be a really good place. And there are really interesting women in that. But, um... But I think, so that is is a big deal. But then the other thing is, I'm sure more people are familiar with Boston than they are with Concord, New Hampshire. We could say that. We could probably assume. And <laughs> um, in downtown Boston is the Christian Science Center with the reflecting pool that... Oh, it's so pretty. Huge, beautiful, and it is like, it is a it's a symbol like you you when you think boston you probably think of faneuil hall you probably think of it, yeah some it's of part these, of the but it's, it's part of the it's city and it's also like city you don't know you're at the christian science building because it feels like a beautiful park that yeah. you're just enjoying the day at and then you're like oh what is this thing yeah <laughs> it's gorgeous yeah yeah and, and how lovely of them to share their beautiful park with yeah. people yeah so and i just think the the presence of such big things that people mm. don't really know what they are kind of does like explains without me having to explain it that like okay you know what i'm talking about but yet you have no idea yeah. the history of this person or this you know, anything really about this religion and i think that is that says a lot about how women's history gets lost so I, wait is this so it's Christian Science. Christian Science is the religion she founds. So it's not Tom Cruise. No, that's Scientology. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Just checking. Right. And Scientology, I don't know a ton about, but it's it's very different, fun, like fundamentally. And Christian Science, we will talk about this a little bit later. But essentially, what she is trying to figure out is the science of Christ's healing. So the healings that. Christ performs in the Bible. She's okay. trying to figure out how he did it. And she, that, so she comes up with her theory on how okay. he did it. Very interesting. And so I think you've mentioned this before on the podcast, but you were raised as a Christian scientist, right? Yes. Okay. So that's another really important thing for our audience to understand. And I, 
always tell my students the first thing that you should do when you are engaging with a new source for information is know your source. And when that source is, I feel like in a lot of cases, I can be a neutral observer of the history, but I was raised as a Christian scientist and not just raised as a Christian scientist, like every family member on both <laughs> sides of my family, as far back as I can trace, were Christian scientists. Interesting. My husband was raised as a Christian scientist. His parents are Christian so scientists. you're in. So we're deep in it. Um, <laughs> I, so t- you like have to check your bias when you're teaching this? <laughs> Um, absolutely. But you're not necessarily a practicing? Well, so I don't want to get too much, too deep into my own beliefs about it because, because, well, for two reasons. I am not a Christian science practitioner. I am not a Christian science lecturer. I do not represent Christian science at all. Um, I just happen to have been raised as a Christian scientist. So I think that is a piece of it. What I'm not qualified to speak to the beliefs or lecture about it beyond sort of the obvious things um, that, that most people could observe and most historians write about. And then secondly, when you get into sort of the religious part of this, it opens up this whole can of worms beyond the history of this incredible woman. And while I think that the religious piece is fascinating, I have never once explained Christian science to a friend in less than an hour. Um, So much of what she does is uh, just different than how other Christian religions do things. And we'll get into some of those details today, um, but I think it would be just in so many ways a a tangent from the reactions and the historical accounts about what she's doing. Got it. So, Okay, um, so... You are obviously well-versed in this space, having been raised in this environment. Yeah, and I went to the only Christian science uh, undergraduate um, college that exists in the world for Christian scientists. So I think... You know, I that that actually presents a big challenge to us, which is just because some of our friends, my friends, are listeners on our podcast. I think we probably have a disproportionate population of Christian <laughs> scientists that are listening. What to up, this episode. CS crap? Yeah, shout out. Um, no, but that's hard. So I imagine that you have in your memory and in your your bank of your brain, which is phenomenal, some thoughts on Christian science. But you're asking your students to go get sources. Yeah. And so I had a, so I have my students do a big research project every year. And okay. they have to pick a person. And um, kids usually pick somebody that maybe they've heard of before. Who's or like a guarantee that someone will always pick. Jackie Robinson <laughs> every year. Really? Yeah. So strange. I know. But awesome. Like, great. I mean, yeah. Great topic. character. Yeah. Um, but... I've had a few religious students choose people from their faith that they wanted to do their research project on. Who we got? Who's on the list? And so I had had a Mormon student a few years ago who picked Smith to do. And it was really hard for that kid to segregate their religious belief from historical Historical fact. fact. Yeah. And... That so my hope today is that I can model that and and to show and you know I wrote I wrote a graduate level history paper on Mary Baker Eddy when I went to grad school and so if someone's gonna write a book Kelsey would be on the nomination list <laughs> no <laughs> no I, it was hard though because people from the church asked to read my paper oh and I felt very like I don't want you to read it because this isn't like I'm trying to write a history paper yeah it's and different there's, I'm there's not going... trying to encourage people to convert to Scientology Ooh. or to Christian science Christian science sorry for the audience <laughs> so so that was really hard and I, I I felt insecure because I didn't want them to read it because I am including criticisms of the church of the faith and oh, of her snap. and I think but I think that that's 
to not acknowledge those things is to do a disservice to the yeah. history and to really frankly do a disservice to the religion because those criticisms existed in history. Well, and, and to the reader. Today. I'm sorry. I don't want a bland topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Give me some juice. Sure. So, um, so my hope today is that I can model for a student how to look objectively at mm-hmm. the, at the sources. And I mean, with, with any, controversial topic and I think a really good question that teachers could investigate Christian science and this is the crazy thing is Christian science was and Mary Baker Eddy were incredibly controversial in their time and like holy moly what a cool thing to investigate with kids <laughs> um no but I'm with you it's also very unique in the fact that someone from New England started a religion and like I just it's very interesting. Yeah. And she had momentum. And as you're saying, she's incredibly famous in her time. Yeah. To gain and garner followers. Right. Yeah. Totally. All right. So I want to talk about her because she is the big thing that I think Christian scientists are known for as the people that don't go to doctors. Yeah. I was like sitting here. I'm like, wait a minute. You were raised as a Christian scientist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you had your child in the hospital. I did. Yes, I did. (laughs) Yeah. And I've had surgery before and I have been to doctors. And so I think my personal practice is not, yeah, I am, it's a spectrum just like, well, any, yeah, any religion. I'm, I was raised Catholic. There's a large spectrum of Catholics. Yep. I'm on the light side. (laughs) Yeah, and I am obviously, like, deep in this community and deep in, I know a lot about it, and I've spent a lot of time um, researching not just Christian science, but religion and, mm-hmm. and that religion in particular. That stereotype about Christian scientists not going to doctors is accurate. Stereotypes don't come out of nowhere. Right. Um, yeah, Christian scientists do not turn first to medical doctors to to treat their ailments. Um, But I want to stop there and stop talking about it there because I think that for the Christian scientists listening, they will gain a great deal of understanding about the religion by understanding the history of the time that she came from. And I think that those listening will better understand the religion by understanding the context of the time that she came from. For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, go to our website, www.remedialhistory.com. You can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Through Patreon, you can sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to behind-the-scenes information, gear, and bonus episodes. But more importantly, patrons are putting their money where their mouth is and making a financial commitment to getting women's history into the K-12 curriculum. We are so grateful to our patrons who sponsored this episode. Our history makers, Jeffrey. Our history heroes, Brooke and Barbara. Our historians, Jamie and Kent. And our allies, Nicole, Mark, Sarah, Leah, Thank you. You guys make this show possible. So um, I want to back up to the 1800s and talk about the status of health. And we've already talked on previous episodes about birth and sort of the like plight that women were in when it came to women's health in in the 1800s yeah quick overview it wasn't great it wasn't great it was very dangerous it was very <laughs> it dangerous was super to dangerous give birth in a women hospital. were in a dangerous place c-sections had been done but they were not, not modern medicine not modern medicine germ theory not, not a, thing. a thing these are Anesthesia. dark times it's, for women yeah. And their health. And their health. And I would say for everybody, like men and women, and but women tend to uh, go to doctors more frequently than, than men do. And that's a huge factor. So um, I want to read a little bit 
to you from America's Women, 400 Years of Dolls, Drudges, Helpmates, and Heroines by Gail Collins. And in this chapter, it's the Gilded Age. And okay. And so think Industrial Revolution, post-Civil War, and this is really the time period when Christian science comes about. And we're in America. And we're in America. Got it. And... um. So she talks in here really just about some of the the status of women's health and of health during this time. Okay. So first of all, she titles the section of this, Oh, doctor, shoot me quick. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, what? Which I just find hilarious. <laughs> so she says one of the more grisly trends in the late 19th century was the removal of women's reproductive organs as a cure for their mental disorders. And keep in mind, hysteria is this term that's used for just like every woman's, woman's plight. illness, yeah. like whatever just, she's dealing with. I mean, this is still a practice in a lot of cultures today, which is pretty depressing. But no shock, it started around here in the 1800s. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's crazy. Can you imagine the hormonal cy- cycles that women are on if you take away their entire reproductive system? Without any, like, hormonal treatment Yeah, or to therapy <laughs> or, yeah. Yeah. You want to see hysteria, just wait. Just wait until <laughs> Watch you... Watch for the shit show. <laughs> no. All right. Um, so, so... Um, women, you know, one doctor diagnosed a woman saying that she suffered from a female ailment. First of all, is that a specific ailment? Like, what does that even mean? Um, amenable to surgery. Um, they, they would remove the clitoris. Uh, this was prescribed for nymphomania and persistent masturbation. (gasps) Um, more common was an ovariectomy in which doctors effectively castrated their patients as treatment for everything from painful menstruation to overeating. And oh at the turn of the century, by one estimate, 150,000 women had undergone this procedure. And she quotes uh, a, that person here. She says, quote, Patients are improved, some of them cured, the moral sense of the patient is elevated, she becomes tractable, orderly, industrious, and cleanly. Yeah, or dead inside. Yeah. It's a toss-up. It's a toss-up. So she says that Gail Collins uh, assesses that it's possible that there was a connection between increasing independence of many women and the surgical assault on them. But it's even more likely that doctors started removing women's sexual organs simply because of the arrival of anesthetics and that made it safe to do so. Um, So that and they couldn't, they were trying to solve for things they didn't have an answer for. Right, exactly. And so they're like, well, if we just take it all. Yeah, the Women's Hospital in New York claimed that 25 to 40 percent of all cases of insanity in women arise directly from organic female disease in which most cases might be remedied by appropriate and timely treatment. What does that mean? A a specific female disease? Yeah, organic it's like you're just talking in circles. Yeah. You're like, I'm just going to say a lot of big words and then tell you it's justified. <laughs> well, made up words. These aren't. Yeah. It's like, like I'm going to string together. female disease. Well, it's, like mar- it's like marketing and PR at the beginning. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to say a lot of things. You're not going to understand what I'm saying and I'm just going to string them together beautifully and then you're going to buy what I'm selling. Oh, yes. This is called marketing. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Yep. So in this section, she talks about how women are have always in time relied on doctors more than men have. And I think a piece of that is just that women's bodies go through a lot more things. Well, than that men's. and men had access to education before women did. So, of course, you go to a man who is well-read. Yeah, sure, sure. That makes and sense And you imagine well. that they're smarter than you. Yep. She, in this section, goes on to talk about some of the drug use that's going on in this okay. time period to treat and deal with some of these ailments. And she talks about how women were particularly vulnerable to mm. the drugs. And it was interesting because a lot of these drugs are not, I mean, it is a blanket drug that women are, people are being prescribed by doctors that don't specifically target 
Well, think you about know, medicine and the discovery of medicine and then the discovery of administering medicine at home. I mean, it's all new. Yeah. And they're just coming up with uh, – how many medications do we have out on the market today? It's like it's mm-hmm. insanity. So it's like – Yeah. They're just the guessing. They're taking their best guesses. That in this time, it is very unladylike for women to drink alcohol. And alcohol is how a lot of men treated their ailments, right? They would go to the saloon or the yeah. bar or whatever. And, you know, they would sort of like numb the, the, pain. the pain or whatever <laughs> they're dealing with in the bar. But women, they're not... It's not ladylike. It's not appropriate for them to be in those settings. It's not appropriate for them to drink. Yeah. And so women turn to doctors more to treat that stuff because there's nowhere there's else to, nowhere go. Else to yeah. go. Right. They're sort of like barred from this other, other way to treat that. But what's really interesting is that most of the drugs that doctors gave them were alcohol. Like, it was essentially some, some form, form of alcohol. And it was, she kind of jokes, um, Towards this, she says, the habit of taking something also extended to alcohol-laced patented medicines, uh, which were enormously popular with women in the late 19th century. The most famous was Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound, which was invented by a Massachusetts housewife whose face was on every bottle. The Pinkham family members were strict temperance advocates, which are like the anti-alcohol people. Oh my God, I love this. And it apparently did not occur to them that there was something wrong with the fact that Lydia's medicine contained more alcohol than the average table wine. (laughs) (laughs) The advertisement got increasingly expansive as time went on, promising to cure everything from painful menstruation to unhappy marriages. Yeah, because you're so drunk. (laughs) Like... You're under the table. Yeah. Uh, Earlier, she Forget codeine. Right. (laughs) You might just well intoxicate your liver. Right. She talks earlier about how women were particularly susceptible because they were alone. Right. Especially in rural areas like where Mary Baker Eddy grew up. They were alone. The same problem exists today. In rural communities that don't have access to a lot of things, there's high alcohol use. Yeah. It's cheap. It's easy to get to. And you can do it by yourself. Yep. She said, she quotes here, um, pharmacists would talk about this, that, quote, young women cannot go to a ball without taking a dose of morphine to get them agreeable, a druggist said (gasps) in 1876. Agreeable? So how much rape is happening at those balls? (laughs) Yeah, that's a whole other issue. A North Carolina doctor claimed he had given one patient between 2,500 and 3,000 shots over 18 months and, quote, so far seen no signs of the opium habit like what, what? <laughs> i think that's verbatim a habit that is definitely a habit that they have over 18 months my yeah. goodness so this just sort of i think this section of her book highlights bigger patterns in in this time period mm-hmm. which is that medicine is is really not targeted or specific doctors are making up ailments that are ailing people because they don't ha- they don't know um they don't really know what's going on yeah women in particular are are, are, are like a victims foreign, of this yeah be, you know species to these doctors um the treatments are false right you know the fact that this 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 woman saying we can cure marriages with our alcohol (laughs) basically you know can you imagine (laughs) it's just wild so the there are wild claims being made by quote-unquote doctors there is you know we don't have things like the food and drug administration we don't have things like well there's not national news to be honest at that time period you're getting things from word of mouth and friends of friends right well you do have newspapers but they're they're local newspapers Mm -hmm. and we'll get into the newspaper bit a little bit later they're not reliable right and so so this is the time period in which Mary Baker Eddy is coming up. Coming up. And so let's back up a little she bit. She seizes an opportunity. Sure. So let's back up a little bit to her lifetime. Mary Baker Eddy's born in 1821 in Bow, New Hampshire. Um, her family is descendant actually from Puritans who came over to um, okay. New England in, you know, early U.S. history. 
And she, her parents, though, were members of the Protestant Congregationalist doc, uh, denomination. So a Protestant branch of the Christian church. Mary Baker Eddy was a very sick kid. She was what's called an invalid, pretty much bedridden for big parts of her life. Some people think that maybe she had an eating disorder as there were accounts of these sort of fits that she would have in her childhood. We know that she had a pretty tense relationship with her father. Um, other people say that those accounts were over-dramatized, and so I tend to want to go to what she says. And she published an autobiography called Retrospection and Introspection in 1891. And in this autobiography, she's, you know, looking retrospectively at her life, reminiscing on her childhood. And one uh, historian claims that this was a pivotal moment in the history of Christian science and a symptomatic narrative of the 19th century confrontation between Calvinism and sentimentalism. They go on to say, at the age of 12, quote, greatly troubled, end quote, by the, quote, doctrine of unconditional election or predestination, end quote, the young Mary is, quote, stricken with a fever, end quote. Eddie narrates this physical illness as a pivotal religious crisis that resolves itself in a transfer of allegiance from her father's relentless theology to a merciful religious faith associated with maternal love. They then quote from retrospection and introspection here and said, quote, my mother, as she bathed my burning temples, bade me lean on God's love, which would give me rest. If I went to him in prayer as I want to, seeking his guidance, I prayed and softly, uh, I prayed and a soft glow of ineffable joy came over me. The fever was gone and I rose and dressed myself in a normal condition of health. My mother saw this and was glad. The physician marveled and the horrible decree of predestination, as John Calvin rightly called his own tenant, forever lost its power over me. The historian continues here. They said, This scene, retrospectively constructed from the vantage point of Eddie's discovery of Christian science, presents a religious notion to a problem that is that first appears to have a medical basis. Eddie undergoes what William James refers to in the v varieties of religious experience as a quote, victory of healthy mindedness, end quote, over, quote, the old hellfire theology. Theological crisis is, in Eddie's account, mapped into the gender polarities in the nuclear family. The attending physician, however, is the one who bears marveling witness to the triumph of maternal love over paternal anger. And so what's interesting about Mary's theology and um, spirituality is that in her life, she has these, these healings, perhaps. Um, Christian scientists would certainly say that. Um, physical healings manifested by faith in God. Um, but there's also this sort of gendered component that maybe retrospectively emerges for her as she's looking back on her life. I'm reading here from an article from the Duke University Press by Cynthia Schrager that was originally published in American Literature. This is cited in our show notes, and I hope people will check it out as I'm citing everything that I'm reading today there. But despite this breakthrough that she has at 12 years old, Mary Baker Eddy is going to struggle with health issues for most of her young adult life. Mary's father believed in original sin, and he believed that people that were sick, um, that illness was a form of God's punishment. And so a sickly daughter like Mary, um, you know, he would believe essentially that she is, she is sinning, that she, something's wrong with her, that this is her fault, that this is God's punishment. And I'm sure that that perspective, again, leads her to really reject his philosophical teachings. Her brother went to Dartmouth and she was not allowed to read his books because it wasn't a place for a lady to be reading those types of books. She was encouraged to read the Bible. And so 
when you think about a person who's going to grow up to found a Christian religion, the mm. fact that she was encouraged her entire life to study Read. the Bible yeah. specifically, I think that is... As your only form of as entertainment. As your only source of information, entertainment, absolutely, yeah. Um, at the age of 15, her family moves, and she's allowed to go to school and um, teachers realize she's a really bright student, oh. and that's really exciting. So she finishes school at the Holmes Academy and went on to teach. And in 1844, she gets married, and she and her husband move to the South, and he dies. Well, that's sad. Six months into their marriage. That's and really she's sad. Pregnant. Oh, no. So she has a kid, and um, she's a new mother. She's widowed, so she comes back to New Hampshire because she can't, she has no money. She has no means in the South. Oh, you weren't allowed to live as a single parent? Right. So Mary moves home to be with her parents because they are the only ones really able to provide for her in this really trying time. And um, then her mother dies, and she is losing this major support system, you know, this motherly love that has always guided her. And her father gets married a year later. And so this new wife of his basically says that Mary and her son, George, named after her first husband, are no longer welcome in the Baker home. And so she has to move in with her older sister, Abigail. But Abigail refuses to welcome George into her home. They don't have the ability um, to keep him. And so Abigail suggests that George gets taken to be cared for by family friends called the Cheneys, who live in North Groton, New Hampshire. Mrs. Cheney had helped Mary and her mother with George in his infancy, and in an attempt to resolve the distance, Mary transferred her dependency from her sister and father to a new husband. Uh, His name was Dr. Daniel Patterson, and he was a traveling dentist. She begged Patterson to move with her to North Groton to be near her son, and um, funded by her other sister, Martha, they were able to do that. So this is probably one of the most challenging times of Mary's life. Um, And it's an interesting moment because she also, in this low time, tries to take control over her life. Patterson, like her sisters, is unwilling to let George come live with them. And so this essentially devastates Mary. Mary's story here is not unlike a lot of women who don't have control um, or are, are not able to make decisions about their own children. She was basically subject to the whim of Patterson. And one person who served them in their home during these years recalled, quote, Mrs. Patterson grieved and worried because she could not see her child and told the doctor that she had given up her folks and had come off up here with him and that she must see her boy and teach him, but Patterson would not let him come near, end quote. In her later years, Mary wrote, my second marriage was very unfortunate. My dominant thought in marrying again was to get back my child, but his stepfather was not willing. In 1856, the story takes this really dramatic turn. The Cheneys secretly move west to Minnesota, taking George with them. Mary is told that George runs off into the woods and disappears, and George is told that his mother dies. Mary wrote later, Without my knowledge, a guardian was appointed him, and I was informed that my son was lost. Every means within my power was employed to find him, but without success. Her means were very little and her power seemingly nothing since parentage could be legally taken from her so easily. One of her historians, Robert Peel, writes, quote, seldom in the history of the sexes has there been an age when women suffered more than in the 19th century from the false ideals imposed on them by the prevailing culture. Fathers and husbands can take those children from women. and Whenever. And and courts will not side with women who do not have an income, right? And there's no jury of your peers. There's no no recourse for a woman in this time. And so it's, for me, it's not as a Christian scientist that I take issue with it. It's as a feminist. I look at that and I say... 
I, I just don't, I, a mother would, would not choose no. that. In addition to arranging for her child to get taken away, Patterson turns out to be kind of like a Confederate spy. He's a traveling dentist and he basically neglects her and abandons her. One of Mary Baker Eddy's biographers, Jillian Gill, said that he was more of a, quote, dandy and a talker than a worker, that he expected his wife's rich relatives to support them both, and that Mary's health became an alibi for his inactivity and financial ineptitude. There was also an economic depression in America in 1857, and in 1859, Patterson was struggling to keep up with his financial obligations. Um, Martha, her sister Martha, was forced to foreclose on the North Groton home, and so they had to auction off all of their belongings, and Abigail took them to a boarding house in Rumney, New Hampshire. Accounts of their time in Rumney suggest that Mary was perhaps dishonest about her illness. In some cases, she seemed weaker when Patterson was around the house to care for her. So a lot of people believe that maybe she was faking her illness to try to keep him home and with her to support her. Um, Sympathetic historians suggest that the limited understanding of spinal inflammation, which was one of her ailments, may have caused her to be sort of misunderstood in this really remote area of New Hampshire. Some locals testified to her kindness towards children, um, but one villager said, quote, her invalidism combined with her extreme nervousness sometimes repelled the young people of that day and caused her to be misunderstood by many of the youngest set, end quote. A community newspaper recalled Mary's ungovernable temper and hysterical ways, end quote. These testimonies seemed conflicting and reveal a general misunderstanding about her personality. Well, and, and they, someone just took her child away. I'm and they sorry. pull her kicking Lose and it. screaming all the way up. And to, I just married a dud yeah. after my love of my life died. Yep. Ugh. Yeah. So it's a pretty... Tough times. It's a pretty tough... So bringing us back to this theme of health and healing, Mary Baker Eddy is positioned, uh, you know, all of her usual ways of getting support, both financially and emotionally and physically, have now been with, removed from her. Throughout the 1850s, she experimented with different uh, forms of healing remedies, including something called homeopathy. And this, the practitioners of that basically believe that you can achieve true healing if you gradually reduce doses of the drugs that you are taking. And um, one of her housekeepers, when she lived in northern New Hampshire, recalled that um, she accidentally knocked Mary Baker Eddy's pills onto the floor, Mary Patterson's pills onto the floor. And Mary said, quote, not to mind as they were no good anyway. Her desperation for healing leads her to consider even more radical and alternative forms of healing. She is introduced through newspapers to this man named Dr. Phineas Quimby, who has a mental healing practice that is growing in popularity throughout New England. And it's intriguing to her because it involved mind healing um, and something that she would later call mesmerism. And because uh, she quickly goes from Quimby's practice to founding her own practice of Christian science, she's basically going to spend the early part of her career, if not the rest of her life, trying to differentiate what he did from Christian science. Um, famous people of her era, Mark Twain included, would accuse Mary Baker Eddy of essentially plagiarizing Quimby's ideas, but she insists that it's really different. Um. What would be a, an equivalent today? So it's, it's, I would argue that it's really like a mind over matter. And oh. so I am going to like meditation? mental through more just like I am going to power through an approach. It's an approach. <laughs> and that type of theory becomes really interesting to her because she's tried a lot of stuff. And, and I'm sure she's taken a lot of things that people like say, this will help, this will help, this will help. Yeah. And reasonably so, she becomes pretty disillusioned. Yeah, with, not surprising. With all of those things. 
she experiments with these alternative forms of medicine and um, basically at some point rejects prescriptions from doctors because, I don't know, like if you read what I started us with and understand what doctors, A, believe about women in right. that time. Yeah. And, and then also what they're prescribing, right? It's not like alcohol isn't going to cure everything much <laughs> right well and it probably increases depression if there's like mental you know behavioral health issues right her sister abigail is really concerned about her pursuing this relationship and study with quimby she begs her not to go fearing that this practice would lessen her faith in god and maybe even take her life she went so far as to bribe her with a house Mary rejected her and everybody else who warned her against her going. She wrote to Quimby saying, I want to see you above all others. I have entire confidence in your philosophy. And while she did study with him for a long time, she quickly becomes to realize that this is a form of hypnotism and what she would call mesmerism. And, um, one of her biographers, Wilbur, Sybil Wilbur, describes Eddie's struggle to disengage herself with what she saw as false te- teachings of the mesmerist and um, to pursue a more true, more Christian um, course. Wilbur says she had come to a crisis when her faith would no longer endure association with ideas so incongruous. Her angel fought with the intruder, which veiled in obscurities could not be named or recognized. The battle was terrific, and it prolonged. The woman who was to promulgate a new understanding of Christianity, which would shake the world's thought to its center, was undergoing the anguish, alarm, and terror of a cataclysmic upheaval, which she concealed from all the world and bore alone. She is a student of the Bible. She has seen and she knows from her readings of the New Testament that Jesus Christ has performed all of these miraculous healings that Quimby's teachings don't really get into. And she is curious how Jesus does that and begins to study the Bible looking for answers, looking for some sort of science to explain what he did. And this is where the story gets juicy. So 1866... It's winter, and she slips on an icy sidewalk and falls and is, like, gravely injured and broken. And she... After being an invalid. Most of her life. (laughs) Oh! So she is taken in and cared for, and basically the doctors are like, she's going to die tonight. Whoa. And from so, falling on ice, from falling on ice, damn. And so the priest comes and like reads her last, you know, will and testament, writes and things to her, and she is <clears throat> in her downtime. Um, she studies the Bible, and she's just lying there reading the Bible. What a familiar place to be. Yeah, <laughs> she's already done this once she, in her life, right? And she. Wakes up the next morning and is better. Join us next week to hear the second half of Mary Baker Eddy's story, the controversial one, where we get to see her clash with famous people like Mark Twain, find commonalities with people like Susan B. Anthony. She will butt heads with Joseph Pulitzer and some of the biggest names of her time. See you next week. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.